welcome to our Sabbath School class. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying scripture with you this quarter. And we have a, an amazing lesson to study this quarter. It is how to interpret scripture. We will be looking at the origin of the Bible. We're gonna talk about how to understand it, how to interpret it, but most importantly, we're gonna be looking at the power that it has to change your life and mine, right here on ADT. Welcome back to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School class. This is our last lesson of our, of our second quarter, so I'm glad you're here. So without any more delay, let us pray. Father, we come to you today. Thankful, Lord, for the past quarter that we got to study the Word, to study the Scripture, to study your instructions to us. Thank you, Father, for having helped us through each and every week. Thank you for having helped us to dig deeper and deeper. And now, Father, as we enter into the last lesson, I ask that you continue to accompany us, to instruct us, and to teach us. Uh, Lord, we ask that you empty us of anything that is unlike Jesus, that you empty us of self, and that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and with truth and with righteousness. Father, I pray that you clear our minds, and I pray especially that you be with me, that every single words that I speak, Lord, may be from you. And I pray that all the hearers, Lord, will be able to hear the words that comes from your throne. If there's any sins in us at this time, I ask for your forgiveness and for your cleansing. And I thank you, Lord. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Just a quick recap from last week. We were dealing with um, how to handle difficult passages, but, but really how to handle any passages that we are studying in the Bible. And we looked at one of the first things we need to have is the right attitude. We need to have the attitude of a, of a learner, not a critic, not a doubter, but a learner, somebody who's willing to learn, a student willing to obey the findings of the Word. And we also looked that there's other types of attitudes we need to have. We need to be humble, we need to be honest with ourselves and with what we discovered. We always need to be scriptural in, in everything that we study. Do not go beyond what the Word has to say and to not leave anything that the Word has to say, but to take everything the Word has to say. We need to be careful not to be uh, diverted or to digress or to go on some tangent. And finally, and most importantly, to be prayerful always be in prayer when the Word of God is open. Today our topic is living by the Word of God. So that's actually very exciting. And our memory text is found in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22. It reads, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Very simple principle. Simply listening to the wisdom of the Word of God, of its principle, is not sufficient. We need to not just listen, but to put in actions those principles. We need to do something about what we read. And if we don't, we're deceiving ourselves. If the Word, for example, tells you to worship God in a certain manner, in a certain way, on a certain day, and all we do is say, yeah, that's, that's good counsel, but we do nothing about it, we're not worshipers. We're only people that has certain uh, knowledge of the instructions that the Word gives us, but at the end, we are self-deceived, not applying the Word. And so today, we're going to look at a few things. We're going to uh, be looking at the Word, of course, but we're going to look at it in relationship to uh, four different things. We're going to look at it in relationship to the Holy Spirit, what is the role of the Spirit, in relationship to Jesus, what you know, we, we've looked at it in several times throughout the quarter, but we're going to look at it in a, in a different view today. Us. 
What is our relationship to the word and what it should be? And finally, we're going to look at the transformation process that the word does in us and for us and through us. And that is actually a very exciting uh, portion here. So first, let's talk about the Word and the Holy Spirit. Um, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God has a very close and tight relationship. Jesus, and of course the Bible, makes that very clear that the Holy Spirit is essential to the Christian walk. It is impossible through, to go through life as a Christian without the presence and the outworking and the inworking of the Holy Spirit. We need Him and there's no doubt about it. But what exactly is his role and how does he relate to the Word of God? Well, in the book of John, Jesus gives probably the most concise and important discourse on the Holy Spirit. So John 16, beginning in verse 7, we read, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So here Jesus clearly explains that he needs to go so that the Holy Spirit can come. The Holy Spirit comes as his representative, representing Jesus now that he is gone. He will be with his people while Jesus and the Father are in the heavenly sanctuary doing a work there. The Holy Spirit is here doing a work as well. And then in the next verses, Jesus explains what the Spirit will be doing. In verse 8, it says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So uh, let's put that on there. So the Holy Spirit okay, will be doing three things. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and finally, of judgment. Now, these are three very important things that the Holy Spirit does. All right? And so, Jesus then comes and explains uh, in the following verses exactly why the Holy Spirit needs to convict and reprove the world of these things. It says, Of sin, because they believed not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, before I, I just tackle this, I just need to address uh, um, something that's been appearing more and more in, in the churches and the scholarly level, and it's this idea of trying to redefine what sin is. The Bible has only one definition of sin, and it is the transgression of the law. When you read the Spirit of Prophecy in over 30 different places, she clearly says the only definition of sin is that found in that passage, transgression of the law. But people have been trying to redefine sin to not connect it or associate it with the law. And this is what they use, this verse here in verse 9, saying, of sin because they believe not on me, saying that this is the actual definition of sin, that sin is a break in your relationship with Jesus because of unbelief. Now, there's a big problem with that. Uh, first of all, it goes against inspiration, clear and simple, but also just when you logically look at this, okay, there, there's a pattern that is established here of sin because, of righteousness because, of judgment because. So if you're going to say that verse 9 is a new definition of sin, then you have to apply that to the next two verses. And therefore, righteousness has to be, the new definition has to be, because Jesus goes to his Father and we see him no more. Which makes no sense. Same thing with judgment. It has to be of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. That would have to be the definition of judgment, which again makes absolutely no sense. So if it makes no sense for verse 10 and 11, it cannot make sense for verse 9. And therefore, this is not a definition of anything. This is an explanation of why the Holy Spirit will be reproving the world. Why would he reprove the world of sin? Because 
because they believe not on, on me, on Jesus. Because Jesus, when he was here, he was reproving the world of sin. He was telling them what sin was. He was uh, exalting the law, showing them what transgression, but they didn't want to believe him. So now that he is gone, the Holy Spirit will come and with power and strength and force will convict and reprove the world of what sin is. Of righteousness, Jesus says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Jesus was the perfect exemplification of righteousness. You would look at Jesus and you would know what righteousness is. But now that Jesus is gone, how are we going to know? Well, the Holy Spirit will come and reprove and convict of righteousness. And finally, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. What Jesus is saying here, he says, there is a judgment to come, and the prince of this world, which is Satan, has been judged. His fate is sealed, and you know what the outcome is. You know that there's a lake of fire, and you know that he will burn and be destroyed forever, and the judgment is coming for everyone that follows him, and he's basically saying, you know. And therefore, do you want to be in that judgment with Satan or not? And so, these are not definitions, they're explanations. Now, having said that, how will the Holy Spirit do that? Well, what is the standard for sin? It's the law. What is the standard to know righteousness? The law. And finally, what is the standard used in the judgment? The law. And therefore, what is it that the Holy Spirit will, um, will convict people of? What is it that he's going to magnify? What is it that he's going to bring to mind? The law. And so the Holy Spirit's uh, power resides in the fact that he has the law to reprove the world. And so for, for people to say that the law has been done away with, kind of like defeats the whole uh, mission of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, if the law is done away with, what will the Holy Spirit use? The Holy Spirit's ministry is just taken away. Continuing verse 12, he says, I have, many, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Here it says that he will guide you into all truth. And in the very infamous words of Pontius Pilate, what is truth? What is truth? Well, the Bible tells us very simply there are three things that are called truth. In, verse, in John 14, 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto me, uh, unto the Father, sorry, but by me. And so here, what is truth? Well, there are three things, like I said, and the first one is Jesus is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Psalm 119, 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. So the law of God is truth as well. One last verse, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, Thy word is truth. So the word of God is also truth. So the Holy Spirit is guiding, directing us in all truth, meaning he's pointing us to Jesus. He's pointing us to the law. He's pointing us to the word of God. That is what it means by having the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but the Holy Spirit does many things. Right? He reasons so that he can reprove. He convicts and he guides. He hears and he speaks. He shows and he prophesies. You know, electricity and power and energy cannot do these things. Only a person can do that. Now, here is what the Holy Spirit does not do. He does not supersede the Word of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's, a, there's some movement, some, I guess, Holy Spirit movement, I would call them, that do things that are unscriptural, unbiblical, unlawful, sinful, 
under the guise of being impressed and guided by the Holy Spirit into these things. Now, that's problematic. Um, the Holy Spirit does guide, does impress. I mean, he, he God-breathed the Scripture. He uh, impressed the prophets with their prophecy. But he does not place himself above the Word of God. Or he does not replace or be uh, beyond the Word of God. The Holy Spirit guides, but always in accordance to truth, according, in accordance with the Scripture, not contrary to it, because God does not contradict Himself. If it's not according to the Word of God, it's not from God. The Holy Spirit does not make Scripture irrelevant or a thing of the past. He is not a new dispensation. Just like when Jesus came, he did not do away with the Old Testament. He enforced it. He, he magnified it. The same way that the Holy Spirit comes and does not do away with the Old Testament or the New Testament, he magnifies the two. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, we read, Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, and hold fast that which is good. We must prove every impression of any spirit. We must make sure that it is indeed from God and not from another source. It's very important. We must be guided through the truth, and these impressions must be tested through the truth, and we have the Word of God to do that. The Holy Spirit will never go contrary to the Word of God or to the law of God. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus and uh, his relationship to Scripture. And we, we've looked at a lot of things, but I, I want to specifically uh, point to something, and it's when Jesus began his public ministry. He did three interesting things. Um, the first thing that he did is he was baptized. So Jesus here, when he began his ministry, the first thing that he did is he was baptized. So let's go to the book of Luke, verse th chapter 3. Beginning in verse 21, it says, that, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. You see, when Jesus got baptized, he did it, First, as an example for the followers, for those who would follow Jesus, for Christians. And in a, in a very real way, he also did it for those who, for whatever reason, would never be able to be baptized, whatever that reason may be. Now, there's something interesting in that verse. If you've noticed, you have Jesus on earth, you have the Father in heaven, and you have the Holy Spirit kind of like hovering in between. You have the Godhead, clearly in three different locations, three different person, three different location, uh, doing a specific work here. Now, when we go to the next chapter in Luke 4, we have the second thing that Jesus did at the opening of his public ministry, and that was to overcome sin. And again, that was done as an example for us, and so in Luke 4, verse 3 and 4, uh, we'll read, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now we've studied this before, but every single time a temptation would come, Jesus would counter it with, It is written, it is written, it is written. Now, it did not just work for Jesus because simply it was written in the Word of God, but also because that's how Jesus lived. He literally lived by every word of God. And that's why when the devil came, he had nothing in him. And Jesus could just remind him of the Word of God, of what it says, and he would have to leave. He had no power. He couldn't do anything. Remember, Jesus did these things as an example for us to follow. So we also have to live by every word that proceeds 
out of the mouth of God. This is how we will also overcome through the word. The third thing that Jesus did at the opening of his ministry is he went to the temple right after the temptation. First he was baptized, went to be tempted, and now he goes to the temple. And remember, all these things are an example for us. And so let's go to Luke 4, beginning in verse 16. It says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Here Jesus, the third thing that he did, is that he used the word as the foundation of his ministry and of his life. He basically told the people, what I've just read, what I've just read here is my life. This is what I will do. I will follow the scripture and you can know everything about my ministry, my ministry if you simply looked at the word of God. This is where my whole life is based on. The word was Jesus' blueprint for his life. And again, this is an example for us. The, the scripture also has to be a blueprint for our life and for our ministry as well. He never placed himself above scripture. He never went and contradicted it. On the contrary, he elevated it and gave it its rightful place. Remember, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In, in other words, Jesus was in perfect harmony with the Word. He was, he was in perfect harmony with himself. He never dis, dispensed the Word or despised the Word. And neither should we. Now I want to talk a little bit in our, last, in our third portion, I want to talk a little bit about the word and us. What is our relationship with the word? How it should be like? How can we spend time profitably with the word that the word may do its work in us, which will be our last part? You know, there's an, there's an effort that we must put when it comes to scripture. We must invest time and effort because no one can do that for us. Not even God will do that for us. We need his help, true, but we need to take action. We need to place some effort. We already read that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, so we have a helper to help us in our study. And so let's look at a few examples in the scripture. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the books by numbers of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandment. And, and the prayer goes on and on. But what is Daniel doing here? Well, the first thing that you, you ought to notice is that Daniel is studying scripture. Specifically, he is studying prophecy. He's studying the prophecy of Jeremiah. But what does he do? A very important point is that he praise. Okay, look at the result, verse 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, 
I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Two very important key points. The first thing is that Scripture should never, ever be studied without prayer. Right? The study of Scripture and prayer is a two-way two communication with God. God speaks through us to Scripture. We speak to Him through prayer. And there's a back-and-forth communication. It's always needful for us to be prayerful. And what's very impressive, is, especially in that, in that uh, passage, is how God is willing and all of heaven willing to assist us to understand scripture to any earnest seeker will receive help from heaven now you may not be visited by gabriel or or any other heavenly angel but there is power available that heaven is is ready to bestow upon us to gain understanding and all we have to do is make supplication to god it may take time it may look different it, but God is for sure wanting to help us. Now, the next point is, is also very important. Like I said, we need to take action. We'll look at this example from Jesus in Mark 1, 35. It reads, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed in a solitary place and there prayed. You see, Jesus understood in his humanity the importance of spending time with God. Now, true, this is speaking of prayer, but it's also just as true with the word. We need to make time for the word. Okay, this is very important. You can't escape that. And um, you're probably like me. Once the day starts, it's really hard to squeeze some time in order to study the Word or even to pray or to do anything. And that's why Jesus understood that. He was probably the most, the, the busiest man that ever lived. The moment that the crowd started, the moment he started his ministry, it was unending until the evening. And so he knew that he needed to make time. And so he did it in the morning. A great while before day began, he was already uh, in, in communion with his father. He's, uh, he was already spending time with him. And you and I, we need to do that. It's a great habit to start with God and to start with the word. You, we need to create some time in order to be with God. And also, the other point that's important is that he also went to a solitary place, meaning he, he created a space that was free of distraction, a space where he could spend with God and not be distracted. And so it's an important point to also not only put time, but have a dedicated space where we can spend with God without distraction. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, we read, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And so meditation, I'll talk a little bit about it, to meditate upon the law, upon the word is also important. Now, keep in mind that when the psalmist speaks of this, he first he says day and night, meaning it's a continual thing. It's a thing that is con consistent. But let's be careful. We're not talking about the Eastern meditation style where you, you sit with your legs crossed and you, you chant with the idea of emptying your mind. That's not what this is about. This meditation is not an emptying of mind. It's the contrary. It's a filling up of the mind with the law and with the Word of God. This is what we ought to do. Because if you will empty your mind, someone will fill it up for you and that's probably going to be Satan. The next point that is also important is fellowship. Fellowship with those that study the word as well. It's important to, to surround ourselves regularly with other people that also love the word. I mean, Jesus himself did that. Uh, we, we read part of this uh, in Luke 4, but let's read it again. 
And Jesus returned in verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus had this custom. He had this habit that every Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue. He would go to church. He would gather with fellow believers and he would, you know, he would be teaching and he would be hearing people teach. You know, there was this uh, fellowship, this gathering together. And that's important. That's another way to spend time with the Word of God. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I, and I understand that. Not every gathering is always conducive or always... Uh, helpful. Sometimes it's difficult. You know, there, there's always, <laughs> there, I've been teaching Sabbath school class for, for a while, there's always like that one or two people in that class that always seems to have like really strange ideas or, or to always go off on a tangent and or sometimes to be very aggressive. Well, just don't be that person, all right? Just, just be the person that studied diligently the Word and just remember, we're all on a journey. We're all traveling on a path. And, and, and those different people that have these different ideas, they're, they're also on a path. They're also on a journey trying to learn. You could be that person guiding them and helping them through that journey to uh, come to the truth, to make the foundation the Word of God and not some bizarre ideas. The last point I want to make now is I want to look at the direct application of what to do with the Word of God. Uh, we've already talked about, yes, we need to apply it, as we saw in our memory text, that we need to live by the Word. But there's something else we can do with the Word of God. Acts chapter 8, verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And we know that in this chariot there was a eunuch, Coming back, going back to Ethiopia. He had just come back from uh, worshiping in Jerusalem, attending the Passover. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And so you have this man who is studying the word, but he's not understanding what he's studying. Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You know what they were doing? They were having a Bible study. All right? Bible study. You can't just be studying the Word for yourself, okay? You have to also share what you know. Either, you know, you do one-on-one you do -on -one or you do group studies. You know, it doesn't matter. You, you just need to be able to share. A lot of people are really, really stressed, really, really worried. Says, I can't teach. You're sure you can. You know, all a teacher does is tell what he's learned. And, and in the process, he might explain something that the other person doesn't know, and that basically makes you a teacher. I mean, it's it's very uh, a narrow idea, but you got to begin somewhere. You got to start somewhere. And all you have to do is share, even if it's just your testimony. How did God work in your life? And then what have you learned from the Word? And this is what we do. We just share what God has taught us. And in the multitude of teachers, we get to an understanding of the Word. And all of us, you and I, we have to be part of that multitude of teacher. Sometime we'll be right, sometime we might be wrong. That's fine, we correct ourselves and we go in the truth. Now the last part that I want to look at is how the Word actually transforms us. And that's very important. Throughout this quarter, we, we've mentioned that the Word's the whole goal is to change and to transform us. But how does that work exactly? 
Well, there, there's a book called Lesson on Faith with, uh, uh, from uh, Wagoners and Jones. And there's uh, two articles by A.T. Jones called The Power of the Word and part one and part two. And, and it's a fabulous study. I highly recommend you read it. And what I'm going to do is, is just kind of like give a, a little summary of what he's talking about because it's so well done. Beginning in Isaiah 55, verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things thereto I sent it. Now, notice what God says. He says that his word will do three things. It will not return void, it will accomplish, and it will prosper. It will not return void, meaning that the word does not stop until it finishes its purpose. It accomplishes, meaning that the word has a mission, and no matter what the obstacles are, it carries it to completion. And finally, it says that it will prosper, meaning the word will profit and be successful. Now, there's three different ways of almost saying the same thing, and it's basically saying that the word does what the word says. In here, there is no trace of doubt on the part of God. There is an assurance from God of success. This is a promise that the word does what the word says. And notice that it is the word that fulfills the mission. It's all about it will not return for it will accomplish, it will prosper. There is no mention of the recipient having anything to do for the word to accomplish its mission. So then, what does the recipient of the word have to do? Or does it have to do anything? Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, did you notice what it says? It says, let the word, okay? The, the idea is to let the word dwell, abide, reside, possess, okay? Just like the Holy Spirit dwells in us, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 26, just like Christ dwells in us in Ephesians 3, 17. Now, this is not a passive work. There's, there's, there's a con conscious choice that we have to make to allow the word to dwell and to stay in us. Same way we have to do something for the spirit to stay in us because we can grieve him and he can depart. We have to make sure that the word stays in us. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually work it also in you that believe. Now, you've, you've noticed that last part. It says that works in you effectually, meaning that the word is active and efficient when it is in us. Just like when the Holy Spirit and Christ dwell in us, they transform us, they change us. You know, the Holy Spirit and the Word, they're, they're not instruments. They're not tools for us to use. Actually, it's quite the opposite. We are the clay that needs to be molded. So how does the Word actually work in us? Well, we got to remember that the Word has power. Remember Genesis 1, 3? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. The Word has creative power. It creates, recreates, changes, transforms. It does that on its own strength and power without anything that we can do about it. The same power 
that was in the word in the beginning, in Genesis, in the creation of the world, is the same power that is here, right now, available to us if we let it dwell in us. It will recreate us, it will transform us, and what we have to do is submit to that change. Allow that change to take place by simply obeying the principles that are found. We obey the principle, and the word then can change us. Now, I know it's a bit hard to conceive because we're so accustomed to the word of man. The word of man has, has no power, right? In fact, if we, if we don't work according to the work of man, there is no change that really takes place, right? Because there's no power with it. So we, we actually have to do what the word of man says for the word of man to mean anything or to have any changes in us. But that's not the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God himself, itself rather, changes us because it has power. The Word of man does not command change, it commands effort. Look at this amazing example. One of my favorite passages, Matthew chapter 8. Beginning at verse 5, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and says, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Speak the word only. And he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. You know, it, <laughs> it takes a lot to make Jesus marvel. But this made Jesus marvel. And he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Fantastic story, powerful statement of faith. Speak the word only. This centurion understood what authority was. But greater than that, he he understood that Jesus, that his word, had authority over all of creation, over all men, and over everything. Speak the word only is all that was needed. That is how the word can transform. All it needs is to be spoken to us we just need to be familiar with it. Let it dwell in us so that it can work effectually. And whatever it says, we do, and we leave the result to the Word transforming us. As we close our quarter this, um, this quarter, the question is, is that the motto of your life? Speak the word only, and that is what my life will be. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for powerful words. Thank you for having given us the scripture. And Father, it is amazing what it can do. And all we need to do, Lord, is to spend some time with it and allow it to transform us as we follow its principle. Father, thank you for showing us the example through Jesus, for allowing the Holy Spirit to work through the Word in us and through us. And I pray, Father, that you will continue to transform us into the image of Jesus. Father, continue to give us the thirst and the desire for your Word, that we may spend more time in it praying to you and asking you, Lord, to guide us. Help us, Lord, to 
put the time that is necessary to do so. And that, Father, when you return, when Jesus return, you will find us in the likeness of your Son. Thank you, Father, for this quarter. Thank you for teaching us and for instructing us. Bless us now, Lord, and help us to be obedient and followers of your word. And I pray this in the name of our example, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen.